Ladies and gentlemen, you knew this was coming. It was only a matter of time. Yeah, and uh, I'm the sad sack who has to record the first game. Fortunately, it's not... Oh, Gillian It's not quite the pain in the ass it used to be, except for those two levels where it totally is. But... <laughs> <laughs> we're we're, uh, we're we're switching roles a bit here because in the, the original hold on a second that's my fucking phone gong uh, shut the fuck up I said shut the I, fuck up I didn't up. realize that we had recruited Coco Bandicoot as our guest Coco commentator ba there we later. yeah I was like oh god I, I'm gonna <laughs> open up on a complaint exploded. And this is a big thing for you me. You can't skip I, this. Yeah, I, I had to start this game over and over for uh, for various recording sessions, and it quickly became uh, wearisome that I uh, first could not skip the opening uh, animation, which the originals totally let you do, and also had to deal with as long as load time. Why does it take so long to load the title screen? Can someone explain that to me? Um, <laughs> just for curiosity's sake, are you playing on an original PS4? Or PS4 yes, I Pro? am, and uh, that's gonna actually show. There's, there's like exactly one place in Crash Bandicoot One where there are frame drops because of that. And I, I watched your playthrough on SGB. You were on the Pro, right? Yeah, I'm on the yeah, Pro. Yeah, there, there weren't any frame drops in that particular spot when you got there in your playthrough. So hey, technical comparisons. Also, better go out and get that PS4 Pro then. <laughs> Gotta have that one level of Crash Bandicoot one place slightly better. Yeah. When you start the game, the voice uh, says the title of each game, and when you get to Crash Bandicoot Warped, it actually does do the Warped! <laughs> I, uh, I like that attention to detail. Uh, and it is Cortex's voice that does the uh, title screen voiceovers, as usual. I mean, it's, it's not um, Clancy Brown anymore, but it's still Cortex. Uh, it's uh, Lex Lang, yep. who I believe started voicing Cortex since Twin Sanity. Yeah. He was great in Twin Sanity. I love him there. Well, was he a Twin Sanity? I don't know who voiced Cortex and Wrath of Cortex. Was it still Clancy? I couldn't tell you. I, it's been so long that I played Wrath of Cortex. Hold the phone. Detail I want to point out. Tiger. That used to be a different animal. They changed it to tiger. You see what they did there? <laughs> mm. No, well, I don't. I don't see what they did there. What did they do? It, it was. It, it was in it. There was a third animal listed on that on the labels there that wasn't ever actually used for a boss enemy. So they replaced it with tiger because in Crash Bandicoot 2, one of the bosses is tiny tiger. Oh, okay. So yeah. Speaking of voice actors, Embryo is also his more recent voice of Maurice Lamarche, the Brain. Speaking of more recent things, this cutscene has actual animation, which is definitely an upgrade. <laughs> I like actual animation. I like how everyone every, everyone brings up that Tana punches the guy, like that's some like improvement. No, no, the improvement is that there's animation. She didn't. <laughs> she turned her head in the original, I think. <laughs> that was well, it. Listen, they had a very tight budget. They couldn't afford, uh, it was, they it wasn't so much a budget thing. They just hadn't worked out how to do expressive animations yet. Like, uh, well, there were some expressive animations, but they all belonged to Crash for stuff like the opening in Insanity Beach. There were like mm. maybe three animations in total. And whenever um, he pops a bone, we're getting a gem. Yeah, it was, it was Crash Bandicoot 2 where the animation production values really uh, skyrocketed. But you know, they brought some of that into the, the remake, and I, I really appreciate it because that is one aspect of the original Crash Bandicoot that I uh, am not sorry to see um, modernized. <laughs> I'm hating this playthrough already. If you're going to individually bounce on every striped crate, I am leaving. Hey, I'm hey, it, 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 it's, it's not a problem anymore. They made it so that it's five bounces now. That's still <laughs> four bounces too many. <laughs> hey, that's that's ten wumpa fruit. That's one tenth of an extra life. Now later in the playthrough, when I start bouncing on them, even though I have ninety nine lives, then you can complain. It happens. Will do. But for now, I'm gonna <laughs> bounce on all of them because it's productive, not because I'm an insane kleptomaniac. By the way, thankfully uh, this game also still just throws lives at you. Yeah. And by the way, uh, thank you, Kadikaris, for pointing this out to me. I don't know why, but I never bothered to think of this before. Uh, probably because I never go back to play Crash One. <laughs> but yeah, if you're fast enough with the Aku Aku invincibility mask, just wait you can a few just run seconds across this. and then run across. Yeah, wait a few seconds, otherwise you'll outrun the boxes and die. Which is a bad idea. <laughs> Still moving faster than the spawn rate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things about the invincibility mask that is uh, interesting to note is that they, it still does the thing where when you get the invincibility mask, Crash will bounce upward. But when you're in time trial mode, he doesn't do that. They remove the delay. So that's something to keep in mind. You really want to use the Aku Aku masks for those platinum relics. 
free flowing movement for getting the time yeah. trials done just well. Something I'm sure newbies can appreciate, but it'll instantly fuck over yeah. veterans. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if you hit, obviously, if you hit something with a, if something quote unquote hits you with an, when you're invincible, you don't kind of bounce. Yeah, no, you, they, just, they, you can just go through it. They remove that, which is good because I've fallen into so many pits because of those bounces. I, I can't even, I can't even say. But uh, another thing about time trials that's worth noting is that they not only add the uh, the time freezing boxes, the yellow boxes with numbers on them, like in Crash Three, but a lot of the boxes actually turn into Aku Aku masks. Um, they really want you to use those Aku Aku masks for the time well, trials in this game because it's because. Either damage boosting or abusing invincibility are like the only ways to get even remotely decent times in Crash yeah, 1 because levels. Unlike the developers of Wrath of Cortex, uh, the developers of, of the Insane Trilogy remember that Aku Aku speeds you up when you get him. <laughs> uh, uh, however, unlike the uh, the Crash 2 where they give you the Crash Dash, one, dash wants to beat the game specifically for time trial modes, they don't do that here. And unfortunately, the problem is Crash 1 levels were not designed to be sp speed run. Yeah, which is yeah. why they didn't give you the crash dash. You'd kill it yourself. It was something I, I questioned in the uh, the SGP playthrough. I'm wondering, why didn't they give you the crash dash? Because crash you'd one? fucking kill yourself. Well, that's <laughs> the thing, yeah. Because I look, you look back at the level design, for and for the most part, I should stress, that it's, it's too condensed. You wouldn't be able to get much. At the, I, I touched burst. on this in the impressions video, but Crash Bandicoot uh, one level design, well, most specifically starting from Native Fortress on up, is very stop and go, where you have to, well, you kind of see a little bit of it here, but it really starts with uh, Native Fortress and the upstream level. But uh, y you have to stop and take stock of what's going on in front of you a lot. It's a lot less... It's, a, it's not as designed to encourage speed running or speeding through obstacles the way Crash 2 and especially 3 were. Bye, Tana. In my headcanon now, she's just always escaping the castle on that vulture from the Great Hall. And Cortex has to fly out and catch her, but he never catches the vulture, so it just keeps coming back and rescuing her. It just her. keeps happening, yeah. Well, because <laughs> I really know the bird is... He doesn't know the bird betrayed him because he has so many in Slippery Climb. And, like... You know, Vicarious Vision said that they might do, like, original Crash Bandicoot games uh, if this does well, which it kind of already has, so fingers crossed. But, you know, that's a game I want to see them do. The Tana Bandicoot Adventures. Just, like, every level is her escaping from the castle and winding up in some, some new wacky location. <laughs> If they did that, if they did that with Mario, Super Princess Peach would have been a hell of a lot more interesting. <laughs> Instead of having your superpower be crying a lot. What they should have done for Super Princess Peach is make it, make it a stealth game and you're just escaping Bowser's castle. Yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> Super Princess Peach is like, the jokes write themselves. I have no idea what they were thinking. Like, maybe they were trying to make fun of themselves but played it a little too straight? I'm, I'm not sure. I can't really tell. The Great Gate, the first of the native um, gate climbing levels. Interesting thing about the design philosophy behind this game, keeping in mind it was in development before anyone knew that Super Mario 64 was even happening. Um, they, the name, the the code name, Sonic's Ass Game that everyone laughs at. It had an actual practical purpose to the developers, and that's the name referred to the problem of portraying. You're staring a, at Crash's backside the entire game. No, the problem of because you're you're staring at his backside the entire game. It's hard for them to present a character to you. So there were uh, three specific things that they decided on really early on to mitigate this. Uh, Super Mario 64 didn't have the problem because you could control the camera. But the three things they decided on were you start the game facing the camera. There would be some stages where you run toward the camera, and there would be some stages where they put you in a side-scroller perspective so that they could present the character to you the same way a side-scroller game would. This is all because they decided... To, this is all because they they were hell-bent on sticking to the linear hallway design in 2D platforming section instead of just making a full-range 3D game. They right? also, back on the original PlayStation, specifically gave Crash's back different shaders so he stood out more compared to the environment. Yeah, yeah. Everything about his design was 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 designed with that in mind. By the way, yeah, you're going to be seeing a lot of Aku Aku invincibility masks because it's it's pretty far into Island One where things can actually hit me again. And since I'm at level two, every time I pick up an Aku Aku mask, I just go invincible. You're invincible. And place through the level. <laughs> basically, uh, everyone here is run through Crash One at this point. The first island is basically no challenge to us. 
Yeah, that's why the entire first island is in this first part, and the rest of the game is the other two islands. <laughs> Oof. More so in the remake, because again, uh, you can die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, it doesn't really affect whether or not you can die, because I don't die in this. Well, I, I, I die I, in Native I'll Fortress. Tell you, but, I'll, but. but I'll tell you, though, the fact that... I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Even from the first game, uh, from the first experience, not uh, bearing any time my uh, death perception fucked me over and I fell into a pit like a dope or I may have missed a ledge by a centimeter, my playthrough of Crash 1 on the Insane Trilogy was inherently less stressful knowing that I don't have to do everything perfectly Yeah. just to get a clear gem. Now, color gems, that's a different story. We'll get to that. But and even then, the color gem can... doesn't really isn't too bad depending on how you prefer your levels. Yeah, but knowing that I can die just to get a clear gem means, okay, finally, I don't have to play with a stick up my ass. Yeah. Also, is it just me, or it's something I'm not sure if I brought up, but on the overworld map with the boulder there, is that specifically designed to be kind of designed and tilted like the universal globe thing? Uh, not really sure. I think it looked like that in the original, though. No, uh, I'm pretty the... sure it did in the original. I'm just saying, was that intentionally designed to look like the Universal one? Because Universal was the... No, uh... I'm pretty sure the band around it is just there so that in the original game, when graphics were simpler, you had a visual reference to see that it was rolling. Um, at the same time, know. I can see where Ryan's getting at, because without Universal Studios, there wouldn't be a Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> yeah, so. but you know what? Without standard globes, there wouldn't be a Universal Studios logo in the first place. That's just the equator. I see your, I see your, I see the game you're playing here. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, uh, the, the funny thing about these boulder levels to me specifically is that like everyone complains about how cheap they are. Like everyone complains about. No, they break. No, cheap. they break the boxes for you now, so you don't have to get any boxes no, on the path. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about beating the boulder level. Everyone fucking complains about these things in every goddamn review. And I've been breezing through these things since I was like six. Like they gave me trouble when I first started the game when I was really young and bad at video games like I had to get my cousin to beat engine for me that's how bad at video games I was but now it's like I'm just getting all these boxes on purpose because it's my habit and it's not memorization because I don't know what's coming ahead of me I don't bother to commit it to memory but you have about the same amount of reaction time in these boulder levels as a classic Sonic game with actually good level design so, you can react. I would say a part of it is memorization, though, you realize, because you've played the game before, you know there are boxes on the road, you know what to look out for. Yeah, but even if you've played a game, like, a million times, that doesn't mean that you remember the specific box placement I think time. I think everybody... Here, I think, personally, subconsciously, everybody remembers I have, certain details no, no, about I, things I have they've the, um, before. I have the boulder levels in Crash 2 memorized, because I go back and play that all the time. I very, exactly. very rarely come back to play Crash 1. And I still breeze through the boulder levels because they're just so much simpler than the ones in Crash 2. So I don't need memorization to react to that shit. It's a very simple level design because Crash 2 has that thing where the levels are designed to make you swerve around. Whereas in Crash 1, for the most part, you just sort of have to jump. And jump again. And maybe go to the left a little bit, but mostly just jumping. Jump around. Yeah. Jump around. So... Those are probably the easiest part of the game in the long run, just by my perspective. Also, the easiest Platinums in the game, because the Platinum Relics were really not designed for those kind of levels, which is probably why Crash 3 did not do them. The Platinum and Boulder levels are pretty much don't miss a time box. <laughs> yeah, don't miss a time box and... And uh, don't stop. <laughs> and don't stutter at the very end, otherwise you'll miss the Platinum Relic by a tenth of a second, which actually happened while I was recording for this play. I was going to say, are you, proje <laughs> are you projecting there a bit? <laughs> yeah, it was a tenth of a second on my first take for the Platinum Relic in that later on, and I missed it by a tenth of a second. I was so salty. <laughs> yeah, I know that feel. I missed the gold on uh, Hogwild and my recording for Crash 3 by .01. Yeah. That that stuff like that will kill a man. Now, a fun thing about these water levels in the original game is that apparently Miyamoto tried out the, tried out this level at one point and was so impressed by the water effects. This was PlayStation 1 at the time and Crash Bandicoot looked so good that people thought it was fake, remember, um, that he was actually inspired to make more water levels. I wonder if that also, might be where me Sunshine Crash Bandicoot came from. Okay, is the instigator to Sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Perhaps. <laughs> so I have him to blame. Possibly also Wind Waker. Who knows? 
<laughs> well, Wind Waker was actually more designed, according to interviews, that Wind Waker was more specifically designed around Miyamoto's desire to use wind yeah. as an element. But at the time, Crash Bandicoot won, and this is less relevant to the Insane Trilogy because, well, the Insane Trilogy is just technologically your standard PlayStation 4 game. But I mean, I mean, the game still looks great, but... Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying at the time... Crash Bandicoot was really clever from a technological standpoint. There were a lot of little tricks used in the level design to make it look as good as it did on early PlayStation 1. Yeah, and... uh, one of those being that the boxes were so easy to replicate and put wherever they wanted. That's why they made them, so yeah. they could put the power graphics to There's other things. There's not much things that are easier to model in this world than a box. Well, <laughs> originally... originally boxes weren't a part of the original game they just um, they were they were, they were placeholders and they were they were well that, that's they the thing up. they made they made level design first and they made the enemies and that were they were going to leave it at that originally but then play testers complained that the levels were too barren and plain so they added boxes to have the players something to do while they were traversing through platforms yeah, that was one of the factors, but uh, they, when, the boxes themselves were kind of a placeholder object until they just decided that they worked for the visuals. Well, mostly because the boxes put no strain on the resources. Yeah, so. because they're easy to render and, more importantly, easy to duplicate. They could have a lot of them on screen at once. And that made for a, a staple element of the series because the boxes became sort of a puzzle element in the platforming challenges. By the way, Papu Papu has two extra hits, like in the Japanese version of Crash Bandicoot 1. Like in every version of Crash Bandicoot 1, he's a fucking joke as usual. Remember, Ted, when we did Crash 1? You literally blinked and missed this. You were on another <laughs> tab, and, and Ryan killed the boss while you were on that other tab, and you didn't know a boss had happened until afterward. Considering that it, uh, it was the Crash playthrough, I was probably actually playing Mario Golf on my DS at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ted blinked and missed the whole commentary. <laughs> Another thing that they added though, that I do appreciate is little uh, ending animations for all of the bosses uh, in Crash 1. Specifically. I would have I would have preferred if Crash just kind of shrugged and then just walked out the front door. <laughs> you are right, though. Like I actually made an effort to, to pay attention, and that is like a 20-second boss, though. <laughs> Well, it, it could take longer if you try to do it the proper way, but as soon as you realize you can just jump on his head before he starts attacking, there's basically no point to playing it properly anymore. Hi, Coco. Watch out. She's trying to steal the spotlight. And yeah, um, as soon as you beat the first boss of Crash 1 and 2, and from the very start of Crash 3, you can go to the, to the Coco's time machine in the map screen and recruit her to your game. It's totally optional, you don't have to do it, and if you ever get tired of her, you can always just go back and put her there so she's not in your menu anymore. But uh, yeah, Coco is now playable. She's functionally identical to Crash, lots of great animation work going in here. I mostly play as Coco when I'm playing on my own time, but for the purposes of this playthrough, I switch back and forth pretty evenly. It's called Crash Bandicoot, not Crash and Coco well, Bandicoot. I play as Crash for uh, first run-throughs. If I'm going back for a gem or time trials, that's just a Coco. Yeah, yeah. For the most part, whenever I go to a... Whenever I revisit a level uh, for this playthrough, I switch over to the Bandicoot I didn't play as the first time through. For the most part, there are a few times over the course of the playthrough where I just forgot to do it. But, um, yeah. So, um, me... I, was act I actually brought this up when we were doing our... Our live stream last night, so you now you know when this was recorded, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this Splatoon 2 yeah. live stream, to yeah. be fair. Um, yeah. So, I do think it's really cool that they added Coco into the game, because, like, even into Crash 1 and 2, because I know that she's in, like, some of the, the GameCube and PS2 games and whatnot. So that's neat. I just feel like it's a missed opportunity to not give her some sort of different attribute to Crash. Here's the thing about that. And this has more to do with series history than anything. In Crash Bandicoot 3, she was literally just a vehicle character. All of her levels were vehicle stages. Like, that was all you got to play as her. People wanted to play as her on foot, possibly because of the two seconds at the beginning of the Tiger stage where you actually get to do that and she can walk. She can walk and, <laughs> and jump. jump. And, 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 and then Wrath of Cortex happened and everyone went, eee. Yeah, Wrath of Cortex happened and it was a selling point. They put it on the back of the box. In fact, I've got the box somewhere around here. It says, uh, yeah, here it is. I'll read it off the back of the box that's behind my computer monitor. Uh, <laughs> Play some something reason. else. It says, <laughs> you go, girl. For the first time ever, Crash's tough-as-nails sister Coco is fully playable. By fully playable, they meant she was Crash, 
but she couldn't spin. She couldn't do any of the special moves he got from bosses, and she could do a sissy little kick move, sort of like Sonic the Hedgehog, really. Yeah, um, so it's, it is, it isn't it is like, say, Tails, where, like, oh, you can play as Tails in Sonic 1 and use all of Tails' abilities. She doesn't have, like, a standard ability. With that said, I would have liked if they made up something for her just to make her a little bit more different. I guess. Yeah, but if you do that, you eat, uh, that if you do that though, you eat, risk at making her better than Crash, in which case oh, well, we have no reason to play as Crash. Well, then I would, if that is the case, then I would have her be unlocked by beating the game, and then you can go back to all the levels and play them as Coco. The real problem is that the levels were designed for Crash's specific move set. I get the feeling that if Vicarious Visions makes another Crash game after this, they'll probably make Coco playable with some special feature that's unique to her and then give Crash his own unique move. But for this uh, this game, they they were focused on being pretty true to the original experience. Adding Coco in was a hell of a lot of animation work, but I guess they didn't want to uh, I, I guess they didn't want to risk having to rebalance things to accommodate her moves. I mean, ultimately, I do think it is pretty cool that they added her in to begin with. It's just, it's more of a, I wanted them to be, to do more, not that they didn't do enough, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I appreciate that she's here. I, 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 I enjoy playing as Coco more than Crash, simply because I like the character. But it's, it's a purely cosmetic thing. So it's kind yeah. of a two way street, though, for me personally, because there's part of me that wishes that at the end of Crash 2, they don't give you the Crash Dash because it was totally unexpected for them to do so. And I get it. It's for time trials. But one of the things that I kind of wanted from the Insane Trilogy before it came out was that at some point or another, as a bonus, you can get the slide or the belly flop for Crash. Yeah, 1. like the spin dash in Sonic. Yeah. One and all sort of like. Yeah, ex exactly like that, because I missed those so much, and I think it would have been a neat incentive for actually beating the game and going back for time trials and all that sort of thing, but they don't do that, but for Crash 2, they give you the Crash Dash. I'll tell you the what. The only time they do that. A slide jump would have broken Stormy Ascent in 2. I like <laughs> yes, breaking <it> things. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we'll get to Stormy Ascent at the end of the playthrough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they released that right before I finished the recording so i actually worked it into the natural flow of the game and got all 27 gems by the end of this good timing. Uh, speaking of i am totally good at the hog stages like there's only one jump in hey oh you put that in your tinder account <laughs> there's one jump in this goddamn stage that for some reason i just can't judge properly though and um it's way back at the end here uh after this checkpoint it's like right at the end of the level two, which pisses me the fuck off. Well, hey, on the bright side, you can die. <laughs> yeah, Ho Hogwild is the first reason that I'm glad that I can die, so I don't have to start this over. But yeah, it's these rotating hogs, because you can't really depth perceive these things. And this always happens. I catch it on its way down. You have to jump a little bit later than I was jumping. So yeah. And crash landed ass first right into the slice. Yeah, first try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a detail that I love and I saw in the previous video is that they place a they place a, a, a tribesman there right before the goal. If you get I hit by video, it, you get launched into the goal and it counts. <laughs> and it counts. That's amazing. Like I love that attention to detail. Yeah, it's 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 pretty great. I I considered doing it on purpose, but I was so frustrated with that last jump that I forgot by the time I actually got over it. So yeah, um, that was unfortunate, but oh well. Native Fortress is kind of like when you get to the phantom boss fight in the original Devil May Cry. It's that first part of the game that really kicks you in the balls at, in places and, you know, tells you that the rest of the game isn't going to be such an easy cakewalk. You're not going to be fighting marionettes the whole time. You could say it's your first roadblock. <sighs> yeah. Native Fortress has... It, it's the first big uh, example of Crash Bandicoot 1's You Need to Stop and watch and time your jumps carefully design mentality, which Crash Bandicoot 1 and 2, for the most part, abandoned. Also, the uh, hints for Crash 1 are almost non-existent. <laughs> yeah. Like, for these vertical sections, the first time you play through the game, you basically have to do a safety jump and then move over to the platform on your second bounce. And that makes the, pl that makes the Platinum Relic, especially in levels like this one, just a massive 
stick of a memorization because you, game. Yeah, I was about to say, you just have to memorize them at that point. You have to memorize it, and you have to get moving so that you get the earliest possible uh, cycle for every one of the platforming challenges. Like in Agapus Rex, when you did that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... Uh, this was the level that made me give up on even bothering with the relics in Crash 1. <laughs> well, the gate levels were, uh, the first time I noticed that the jump height and, the, well, not the jump height, but the, the jump speed. arc and the jump speed were altered slightly from the original game. Yeah. Because I've, uh, I mean, if you even see it in the SGB playthrough, when I'm bouncing on top of the steel crate, sometimes I just can't position Crash or Coco directly on top of the box and I end up falling on yeah. the side or well, the same. Well, another difference is that, like, uh, the way you move left to right while jumping has been has been changed to match the Crash Bandicoot warped physics across the board. Like, there are some minute differences in the way jumping works between the three remakes, but the physics that are the base for all of the control schemes, that was my dumbass mistake there, <laughs> uh, ha have been based on Crash Bandicoot warped just to give the, the trilogy a unified feeling. And that's... Um, I prefer that, personally, uh, especially in Crash 1's case, but the, the real dick of it all, though, is that the collision detection really does, does not work for Crash 1. It works for Crash 2 and 3, but there are some really super precise things in Crash 1 that are made even more super precise by the fact that Crash's hitbox is now an egg shape instead of a block. His feet are actually feet and not massive squares. Yeah, like, like there was a big invisible square that would determine whether or not you landed on something in the uh, in the original game, and now it's an oval, and, and that means the bottom of your hitbox. Shit like that can happen. Like that. Well, no, that was that was me being an asshole <laughs> and <laughs> and half-assing. Oh, no, Lois, <laughs> stop being an asshole. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, one thing I'm did glad they changed though of. With the uh, current jump height, you can now just kind of jump towards those spinny things and then fall back and not have to either fall down or do it underneath. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's easier to pull back out of a bad jump if you notice just after you jump that it feels wrong. Um, it's not you know always gonna work. There's one place later on where I try to do that and fail miserably, but um, it, but you know it's it, it's something that you can more easily you can more easily correct your jumps and save yourself. Um, so that's a plus. I don't think you had that kind of th that kind of maneuverability in Crash One specifically. Pretty sure you did in Crash Two, um, and you definitely did in Crash Three. But uh, you barely needed it in Crash Three because you had an actual double jump in that game. Ugh. And the tornado has been mm. out of my ass. I like I like that they added an animation for when you fall and land from too high a, a distance. Crash Two and yeah. Three had that, but Crash One. Yeah. Didn't know. A lot of the cool animation quirks of Crash 2 and 3 have been added to Crash 1. In fact, a lot of stuff from 2 and 3 have been added to Crash 1. It's almost like, what is, is just a significant newer game? Is the Crash Dance game? in Crash 1? No. What? The Crash Dance in nope. Crash... It, is, oh, no. It, not even it? as, not no, even no. as an Crash, animation? The Crash Dance has an interesting backstory. Uh, the dance itself was created by the Japanese for the marketing of Crash 1. And the... Naughty Dog apparently liked it enough to implement it into the game, or maybe they did that to appease the Japanese audience. They, I know, that, I know for a fact that part of their reasoning for making Coco was that it's a character that the Japanese would like. But uh, they, the, the Crash Dance. The Japanese has, added a lot of things unintentionally, like Fake Crash. Fake Crash, yeah, but Fake Crash was an Easter egg joke. The Crash Dance actually became a staple across the board. Ow. Okay. Pro tip for the flame uh, throwing sections. I fall into a bad habit of holding the jump button whenever I bounce on things. Actually, don't want to do that here uh, because it screws up your timing crossing multiple flaming bounce pads. So, um, yeah. The thing I don't like about the uh, the flame boxes here is that their hitboxes are deceptively timed. Like, as soon as the the fire starts, its hitbox is entirely there. It doesn't yeah. ascend with the fire. That's the, that, the entire hitbox is there. They could have they could have tweaked that collision detection yeah. a little, but they didn't for some reason. God, that you're was wondering, you. Like you're jumping on top of the thing and you're wondering, wait, I'm clearly above that fire and it's acting like I touched it. No, it's yeah. because the hurt box is there. And, uh, it's 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 frustrating. Yeah, there there are a lot of little things in this game that have those those deceptively difficult hurt boxes. Oh, by the way. Uh, 
Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy drinking game. Uh, every time we mention Hitbox, Hurtbox, close our deck. <laughs> Before we go on, I want to highlight something, John. Every time I see you go to that goddamn back area at that specific jump point, you don't drop down and get the life. Why do you not nope. do... <laughs> it's a life. It's there. To annoy the shit out of you. Grab it. <laughs> uh, Your pain gives me life. No, because you giving him pain did not get you the life. You're now one life down. <laughs> now, interesting thing that I only really bothered to notice during this playthrough, because it was, I was the only time... They I added a platform here, through. yeah. Oh, well, yeah, they added platforms for the gems, but that's Specifically for Johnny. Out. What I was actually going to point out is that all the goddamn... Well, almost all the goddamn colored gem paths are on the first island. I think it's like something like half of the colored gem paths. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a weird balance. It's like they put all of the... They didn't let you get any of the gems in the beginner levels because they wanted to see you suffer. Or something. Gotta pad that game time. Yeah. Okay, so this is the part where I edit in a nostalgic commercial from the past in order to pad out uh, video length and get a, get a chuckle out of some people who are easily amused. Eat the slock, you filthy sheep. <laughs> はい、じゃあ次山田君。おしゃれさんね。はい、じゃあ次クラッシュ君。脱がなくていいのよ。ん体中傷だらけだな。どういうことなんだ。みんな何も知らないのね。私は<笑> そう傷は、パパが曲げられたり、サーフィンで失敗したり、土に潜ったり、あんなことやこんなことやね。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。